So today I am going to talk about models of evolution and selection in structured populations. And by that I mean populations that aren't, can't, where all individuals can't be treated as homogeneous, but there are attributes them, about them that affect their survival and reproduction. Look around any population and typically it's age structured. There's in young individuals, juveniles, and adult individuals, individuals past menopause who are not reproducing. And um, populations are often age structured. Some populations are stage structured, by which we mean that there may be individuals at different size classes. But again, it's structured. This little plant does not have the same reproduction expected from as a larger plant. Mike's been talking about spatial structure. And sometimes that could be even at a very low scale, uh, patches within uh, an environment that differ in quality. And so depending on where individuals land, they may have higher, fitness, higher survival or reproduction than, than others. And I even talked about a model earlier about um, COVID when this didn't look like it was a structured population. But if you think about it from the virus's perspective, it was a structured population. The virus can either be kind of in an early stage, like a juvenile, where it's just um, starting to grow within the individual. It could be in a teenager phase, where it's at this pre-symptomatic phase, and it could be a kind of late adult stage. And so we can think of individuals in these disease models as moving between these classes, just um, by analogy to an age-structured population. So the, this graph over here um, is from Wikipedia, and it just shows the uh, age structure at the, um, in the world from uh, newborns here to the number of individuals that are 100 um, left as males, right as females. It oddly calls it male surplus or female surplus, and you're like, what's this about? What's the surplus mean? And this just means that these darker shades illustrate where there are more males than females in the distribution of ages across the world. So there tend to be more male young individuals and more female old individuals. Um, and that just reflects sex differences in survival and reproduction. So, so far we've been talking about S as, as, you know, as, this, as this quantity about how does a mutation affect fitness, but how do we even measure fitness? when it's structured in this, in these ways. Yes. Very what? Blurry. Blurry. Yeah. So, um, and, and when I'm talking about the age structure of the virus or the infections, I'm not even paying attention to this one. I'm just saying when the virus is entering individuals, it will move between these classes. But you might say, well, I want more classes. I might want individuals infected for one day, two days, three days, four days, and I might want a much more refined structured population model of those infections. Just like you might say, I don't want to loop all the ages of a population together into one and have one fitness. I want to think about survival and birth rates at each age. And it is the, one of the, the questions that you're alluding to is what's the right scale, right? How do I know I have enough classes in my model? And you can do that by do, sometimes you only have data for one. So in Canada, when I've analyzed the age structure of the Canadian population, we only have census data every five years. So there's no point getting, going to a model that tracks ages by year because I don't have any data for that. So I track them in five-year age classes. Flipping it around, what you can do is say, if I model it with five-year age classes, and then I group them together in 10-year age classes, or 30-year age classes, or 50-year age, when do I start getting really bad projections into the future? So, um, and that's a general approach to take, is start somewhere, and then add more and more details, and see how robust your results are to those details. So, yes. Um, generally, we may want to add more classes, more structure into our models of evolution. So before, um, let's 
just got that. Oh. And that may be not listening to that. That might be why. It's not listening to this either. Hold on a second. Let me try. Okay. So before we answer the question of this lecture, which is how does selection act on structured populations, I want to talk, I'll need to talk about how do we model structured populations. And one caveat for this whole lecture is that I'm going to talk about this, these modeling approaches for linear models. Linear models, um, by, by that I mean that there's some function of, of um, let's see. Actually, I'm going to do juveniles and adults. The number of juveniles and adults is some function of the number of juveniles in the previous time point. So this is at time point plus one, p plus one. So this is the number of juveniles in the next time point. This is the number of adults in the next time point. Is the num the um, birth rate of the juveniles times the number of juveniles that there were plus the number of adult births times the number of adults that there were. I'm just writing down a general um, form of these equations. To be an adult, you could have either been a juvenile before and then you survived to adulthood or you could have been an adult before and survived as an adult. This is just a general example with two classes, juveniles and adults. But the core point is it's got to be these linear functions of the numbers. No n squared, no n's over something else, no anything else, just a linear model. And so that's, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And, not, and of course, there's more complicated things, density dependence um, and other interactions that make things nonlinear. But this is also a very useful um, starting place because oftentimes we can kind of look locally at what's going on with the dynamics of a population and at least at a local time horizon approximate um, growth of the population with linear equations like this. Okay. So, all right. So we're, there's a little bit of terminology. We talk about the vital rates and those describe these birth and survival rates from in each age class. So um, uh, the notation is typically birth rates are called M's, death rates called D's, survival rates um, are, are the inverse of the death rate. So if there's a death from one census to the next of um, probability D, then one minus that would be the survival probability. And I should also say a little bit of something about time. When we modeled populations before, we were really focusing on a generation between our censuses. So when I said there's an annual plant, we would come and measure the population sometime in the year, let's say spring, and come back the following spring. And that's when we were censusing. Now, like with the human population, if I'm censusing every five years, it's not a full generation. So time, um, you decide on your time step according to the data that you have between censusing that population, whatever it is. All right. So here is kind of a generalization of that, um, that uh, idea to a population that has any arbitrary number of age classes, age one, age two, age three, et cetera. And these classes can represent like zero to five, zero just before five, five to 10, 10 to 15 year olds, et cetera, whatever your age classes are. And they've got these movement rates. You can only become age two if you were age one before and you survived and, you, and your, your groups matched your census time. So you had to be in this age group, you had to have been in that age group before and no other person will get there. <laughs> you can't be five to 10 now in this census if you weren't zero to five in the previous census. And then we have these birth rates that all contribute to this first age class. And so in a structured population like this, 
We now have to pay attention not to the total population size, but the numbers of individuals in each age class. And I'm just lopped it off at four age classes, but for the human population, you really want to go um, to include up to year 100. And we can just turn this diagram into another form. It's called a matrix form, a Leslie matrix form, which is just a bookkeeping device to write all of those transitions in one kind of neat place. So Leslie matrices have this form where the first row gives the birth rates, the birth rates from the first class, the second class, third class, et cetera, all on the top row. And then the chance of, of surviving from the previous class to the next class is in this sub-diagonal, it's called. The diagonal of a matrix is this one. The sub-diagonal is right below it. So for example, this is measuring the probability that it was in the first age class before and survived, contributing to the second row, which describes the number of people in the second age class. So that is a Leslie matrix. And uh, this is, again, a bookkeeping trick. And when writing things in a matrix, I can write this set of equations kind of more compactly by using matrix form. So let me, I'll walk through that on the board. But basically, we take a matrix, and that's describing all our transitions. We take a population state at any point in time, and that'll give us a population state in any future point in time. Many of you won't have had matrix algebra before, and I'll, it's hard to get everything smushed into a single lecture, but I'll give you a little bit of familiarity with matrices. These matrices, um, this is a, a matrix, and it has a certain number of rows and columns here, four, but it can be any number of dimensions. This is a, a vector. It has four elements containing the number of individuals in each age class. Let's do it a little bit simpler with just the two age classes that I have here. So this, linear, this is a linear set of equations, and any linear set of equations can be rewritten in matrix form um, where we represent the state of the population as a vector. So this is the same information as this, but rather than writing two equations in a row, I'm putting top and bottom of a vector. Then I have to have a matrix, and then I have a vector representing where we were the previous time step. Okay. In this particular case, I allowed individuals that were in the adult class to survive again, just to keep it in a general form, but sometimes isn't done. It's not done here. There's the, the fourth age class just dies in that, that one. But the, you probably, if you've never seen matrices before, you probably don't even know, like, how does this object even relate to that object? What do I do when I have a matrix times a vector? What does that even mean? So these are dot products in, in math form, but I want to teach you how, to you how to do matrix multiplication with your fingers. To get the um, answer in the first row, you take the first row of your matrix, and you put your left hand there, <laughs> and you take the first column of your vector, you put your finger there, and you, every time your finger is in a position, you multiply those together, and then you move your hands. Your left hand moves on a row. Your right hand moves on the column. So MJ times NJ. And you move your fingers. You add the next one. MA times NA. So what did I just say? MJ times NJ. A times NA. And that gives us the first row and the first column of our answer. I'm gonna repeat that for the next one. Put my, I want the, now I want the second row. So I put my finger in the second row and in the first column of this element. And I do the same thing. I multiply together PJ times NJ.
Then I move my fingers. My finger goes over in the row and down in the column, and I repeat that process for the next element, plus P, A, N, A, T, T. And that's telling me what the adults are in the next time step. And that's what I had written before as just a linear set of equations. So this linear set of equations, I can just write in this form. It's just a bookkeeping. It's, this is like in Excel. You just have your elements in Excel, and these are representing your, your survival and your um, reproduction numbers. But the nice thing about it, it I mean, there's a few nice things. First of all, we can just call this a matrix, any matrix. And I'm using this double line to stand for bold because we normally denote a matrix with bold letters. And let's say this is a vector. We put a little arrow over. To represent a vector. In this form, I can do, I can represent, it doesn't matter if I have two age classes, four age classes, or 100 age classes, as many age classes as I want. I can simplify it and at least understand what the form of the equations are like in this simpler matrix algebra form. Let's go to this larger matrix. It works the same way. You put your first, your finger in the first element of a row in a column. You multiply all the elements together to get the number in the next time step for that first. So how many, like if I wanted the third row, how many individuals in this third class where there would be, what would the answer be for this? Put your first finger in the third row. What was that? P2 and two. The number of ones in the previous age class times the chance that they survive. Okay, so. Any matrix, any linear set of equations can be written in matrix form. Um, I'm gonna, sometimes there's constants for other models, but I'm um, not going to deal with those today. Okay. So the other thing about the matrix um, form, besides this is an easier way to think about it than that, is we can use tools and matrix algebra to figure out how to solve this type of equation going into the future. So just even looking at this equation, I can go, well, if I wanted to know what would happen over time, I know what I could do. This looks really easy. I can just say at any time t, I'm just, I can write the equation one step back like that. But I know at nt minus one is just that matrix again, times where I was two time steps ago. Or, and then I can repeat that, so that would be m squared and t minus two. And I can repeat that back a step. Get m three. And just repeat as many times as I want, just solving this model. back to some original time that we were interested in. So this looks good, that's the solution to the model. But the problem, and I'll show you some examples next, is that actually taking this model and expanding it up to the teeth power is kind of hard to do. So we've kind of shoved a lot of the complexity into this, but what, we, what I want to now do is tell you how can we understand how that matrix will be growing or shrinking over time. Let me go to one simpler example just to get us started. Let's, let's say that I had two patches, but they were actually independent, no migration between them, and they were both growing exponentially. Sorry, NT plus one function of nt in the previous time step. So I can represent this also in a matrix form, but I know the reason why I want to start with this example is you all know what's going to happen. What, are the, what is this matrix going to look like? 
R1, I, I saw zero. This one, R2. And if that were our matrix, and these were growing independently, then I actually, it's um, not too bad. I can do, the, I can power this up. I can square it, for example, if I wanted to. To do that, I use my same finger trick. First row, first column will give me this element. First row times first column is R1 times R1 plus zero times zero, or just R1 squared. That. My first row, second column will be zero times R1 plus zero times R2, that's just zero. My second row, I go here, first column, I go there. Do the same finger trick. I get zero times R1 plus zero times R2. And then finally, second row, second column of my product. Doing my finger trick is zero times zero plus R2 times R2. Not, ba uh, not bad. The first R1 got squared, the second R2 got squared. And if you repeated this as many times as you want, it would just uh, power up those exponents. So in this case, when they're completely decoupled and we have two different things growing independently of one another, then we expect exponential growth of each. And that in eventually, it would just be R1 to the T, zero, zero, R2 to the T, times wherever we started. If we wanted to understand how the whole, so the whole system was growing or shrinking, um, what would have to be true for this whole system to shrink and eventually go extinct? Yes, true, true. But <laughs> um, just in this answer right here, if this is gr if R1 is greater than 1, will this grow or shrink? Grow. So for the whole system to go extinct, this has to be less than 1. How about this one? Less than 1. Yeah, and so the whole system will only shrink if both of them are less than 1. If both of them are less than 2, they're both, both of these types are growing. But the system is still growing, even if only one of them is growing, right? If this one is greater than one and this one's less than one, we're still going to get this, this, this population growing. It'll be composed mainly of N1 over time, but it will still be growing. So you can think of this, I wish I had a rubber sheet, but you could imagine this as a, a rubber sheet that's being expanded by a factor R1 in one direction and a factor of R2 in the other direction, or shrunk. If the R2 is less, then the numbers are shrinking. And what we want to know is describe over time if the system is growing or shrinking. It's easy to do here because we just, the two things are growing kind of independently and we can see the size of the system as it grows. Here it's not so easy. Let me just, you, you really don't want me to do much of this matrix um, multiplication, but I'll do it two steps and we'll see. Then I'll go to the computer to do more steps. So let's just do that one matrix. Now it's not so simple. I don't have zeros on the, in so many spots in this matrix. So I just wanna take and project two steps into the future where this system will be. I'm starting from an arbitrary number of juveniles and adults. All right, well, I have to do my finger trick. First row, first column, MJ time M, times MJ plus MA times PJ. That's that first one. First row, second column, MJ times MA plus MA times PA. Next row, first row, first column. PJ, MJ, plus PA, PJ. That's again, moving my fingers down, multiplying each term 
then summing them to the next position and so on. And then last one, P, the first row, second row, second column, PJ, MA plus PA squared. This isn't that easy. This one, the other one just powered up as I rose, did it again and again and again, only one of the terms um, um, powered up. And that was because it was a diagonal matrix where the two things didn't depend on one another. Now it's getting crazy, it's getting large. And, it, and that's only after two steps. So while I know what the solution to my um, model will be, I'm gonna be in trouble if I have to multiply the matrix times the matrix times the matrix times the matrix. Okay, you don't want me to do that by hand all the time. So let's go and actually, I did this. Um, just some notational comments. When it's a general matrix, I'm going to write M. This is a general matrix. When it's a Leslie matrix with this particular form, um, I'll write L. And again, I'll use a bold face to denote those. So we need to learn a bit more about matrices. So let's go over here. So I want to use the simplest possible Leslie matrix to start with. It has adults and juveniles, but I've actually set the adult um, probability of survival to be zero. That's the more standard form of a Leslie matrix. You just have as many age classes until you can't survive anymore. Um, so this is, I'm using Mathematica as a notebook just so that we can do the math and have it do the math for us. And all we have to do is enter things. So this is notation for um, the number of juveniles at the next time step is the number of juveniles that gave birth, M1, and the number of adults that gave birth, M2. To be an adult in the next time step, you had to have been a juvenile in the previous time step and survived. And so that's the set of equations, of linear equations that I want. And I can write it in matrix form. This is a Leslie matrix, and this is the vector of um, juveniles and adults in the previous time step. We quit the kernel so we can just start everything fresh. And so this is saying in the next time step after one iteration of this matrix times that vector, we have M2, this is the new ba newborn babies, babies of the adults and babies of the juveniles. And the only adults we have are the ones that survived. And this is the same result that we have up here, M1NJ plus M2NA over uh, this, I, using P now to represent the survival, P1. Okay. So I can write it in matrix form, I can write it in standard linear form, either way, I'm describing the survival of this population. And as I mentioned, oh, these ones didn't all get Sorry about that. Just rewriting this. I can um, square it, which is what I did on the board, or I could cube it, and then I get this. Or I could take it to, I don't know, 10th power, matrix power, and you can see that's going to be a nightmare. I'm not going to want to do that for long. Let's, but let's get a numerical handle on this matrix for a second. So um, I've got a little bit of, of code here that allows us to start at any place we want and um, find out how the population grows. So we have an initial number of juveniles and an initial number of adults. Here I'm starting, we can expand this out, with 20 adults and no kids. So this is the red dot, um, no kids, 20 adults. And that, that after one generation, I can multiply and um, find out where the population is, and it hits there in this um, particular example, um, where I start with these parameters. We can change those. Um, a birth rate of one for juveniles, a birth rate of one for adults, and a survival probability of 60%. So after one time step, it, it goes to mostly juveniles. And that was because we didn't have any juveniles to start with. So there's no adults now, right? 
So you can see it's going to, but it looks like it's crashing, but you, these are the number of juveniles. So hard to tell where it's going, right? Let's go another time step. Okay, now we have some adults in the population, as well as the babies that were born from those juveniles. And then we go another time step and another time step and another time step and another time step. So nine time steps later. So there's a little bit of oscillations. What would you like me to change? I'll change something. Just to graph this. I, we, these are sliders, so I can, I can change the number of adults that I start with. It kind of looks the same. I can reduce them. I can have some babies at the beginning or no babies at the beginning. So, what, so um, I want you to pay attention to something. I am changing the initial numbers now, but what's kind of the same no matter what I do? The slope of this angle after a while. Yeah, it seems like it's going in this constant slope. And that, rem and that means that over time, it seems to be settling with a constant ratio of juveniles to adults. Yeah. Tell me to change something. What do you want me to change? What was that? Just an, any other number. What would you like? What was that? M1 or M2. Let's make, which one do you want more babies born to babies or more babies born to adults? More adults. Okay, so that's M2. I'm going to make the um, reproduction in the second age class larger and larger and larger. Or smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's changing, it's a little hard to see, but it's changing that angle that it seems to be approaching. The more um, reproduction in the second age class, the more newborns there seem to be for every adult. I can change the number of juvenile um, births and kind of get the same thing, a change in these angles. Or I can change the survival. And again, it changes the dynamics and it changes where it seems to settle down to, but it seems to settle down to a, a, a ratio of juveniles to adults that is constant after a little while. But not at the first. At first, we have these really strong oscillations because we're starting with um, only adults in this case. So there's a lot of wobble at first and then it goes away. What do you predict should happen so this, is this population growing or shrinking? This is my time point zero, one, two, three, growing. What would happen if I reduce the survival rate? At some point it should crash, right? So let's just see. We'll just reduce the survival rate, P, a little bit, 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 a little bit. and then it goes extinct. But after a while, it starts oscillating, uh, going down, going up. When I have arbitrary, um, the, the, the initial values that I started with, but if I go too low in my survival probabilities, then it crashes. It doesn't grow anymore. And same if I re reduce the, oh, I need more time. Um, if I reduce the number of babies born, at some point it starts declining, right? It's a little, I'm, I'm not going to want to do this, get my computer out and calculate whether this population is growing or shrinking at all future points in time. I want to be able to predict, is this growing or is this shrinking? And so the, as we pointed out, though, there seems to be a special direction, and that seems to really dominate in the long-term future. And the growth of the population or the shrinking, we might want to say, well, what if we started on that, that ratio of adults to juveniles? Is, is there something special about it? And the answer is yes, if we started on that, it would grow by a constant amount every generation. So we're kind of interested in that special direction. I haven't said what, said what it is yet, but that special direction of the matrix is called an eigenvector. It's a direction that if I start on that, it'll stay on that. And the growth factor is the eigenvalue. And the, how many people have heard of eigenvectors or eigenvalues? How many people have no idea what those are? Yeah. So how many people have heard of them, but still don't know what they are? Okay, good. 
Yeah, and th that's the thing is we use this that pops up all the time, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, but oftentimes it's not taught to biologists. And there's, um, uh, I, I shared a matrix algebra primer with you. It's hard to teach you all of matrix algebra in a half of a lecture, but what that primer does is give you more practice um, calculating, doing matrix multiplication, matrix addition, matrix vector addition, finding eigenvalues, finding eigenvectors. So, so for now, I just want to say that's a tool that you can build up, that you can practice getting those tools. But what I want now is to say that, that jumping ahead, if we can find these special directions, we're, it's nice because we can say how the population will grow or shrink in the long term. Okay. So it turns out that we can um, write any matrix power problem like this one, L, the Leslie matrix raised to the power T. We can predict where the system will go in the future using these special directions. Let me expand. This is a little hard to see. There we go. Okay. So our goal right now is to solve matrix problems to predict the future state of the system more easily by finding special directions called eigenvectors and growth along them called eigenvalues. So what are these special um, directions? So here's this arbitrary um, Leslie matrix for an a, a, a juvenile adult um, age structured model. And the nice thing about Mathematica is it'll just calculate the eigenvectors for us. There, it's not that hard, you could do this by hand, but um, there it is. And similarly, we can find the eigenvalues. And those are the eigenvalues. So for a given matrix, if you give me the birth rates and the survival rates, I can tell you what these particular eigenvalues are going to be. Give me, give me a number for M1. This is the birth rate of juveniles. Shout it out. Yeah. Five. How about M2? Adult babies. Ten. Oh, my goodness. How about survival? From juvenile to adults. What was that? Point five. All right, before I enter this, is this population going to grow or shrink? Half the time they survive to adults. But look at these numbers of babies, just intuitively. What do you think? Shrink? Grow? Grow. Yeah. So the eigenvalues are the factor by which the population size will eventually grow from one time step to the next. And you, Deepa really wanted a population that was growing. So one eigenvalue is small. One eigenvalue is large, but, it, but now go back to our rubber sheet. We're stretching in one direction. We're, we're kind of flipping signs in the other direction, but shrinking over time. And eventually the whole system will grow in the direction that we're stretching the most, whatever that direction is. That's called the leading eigenvalue, the one that's biggest in magnitude. And where it stretches or shrinks that, that direction is called the eigenvector associated with the leading eigenvalue. But basically, we're asking Mathematica to calculate what are those special directions. Let me step back a bit and say, in any other direction, we won't just get a stretch or a shrinkage. We'll get a stretch and a little bit this way and a little bit that way, and it'll look like it's rotating. The whole system will look like it's kind of oscillating around a bit in some pattern like this one, where it was a little harder to see where we were going. But if we started on these special directions, we don't rotate ever. We just stay on those special directions and just shrink. So these, th these, have spe these directions are particularly special. We stay, once we're on this ratio, we stay on it. All right. So let me redraw the same plot I had above. But now I've added those special directions on. It's a little hard for me to move everything. Uh, I've added those other special directions on. So here's one special direction. This is the one that's associated with the leading eigenvalue. In, for, in this case, for these particular sliders that I chose, there are two eigenvalues, 1.4 and negative 0.422. 
the largest one in magnitude is 1.422. And that is telling me that eventually the population will be stretched by a factor 1.422 each time step. So it'll grow 42% each time step. And that's associated with this direction. So the, the, the 1.422 is the eigenvalue, and then this over, over 2, 3, 7, and up 100, this direction here, is the eigenvector. The one on the question. So the, sorry about, I can't get, I didn't get a really nice, the first number in there are the eigenvalues. Those are the stretch factors. The second factor, the second two elements in the braces are the vector. And they represent the X and the Y direction on this. So 2.37 is, oh, X equals 2.37, Y is one. And that is how I plotted this line. So first one is the stretch, fa the factor, the eigenvalue. Um, if I reduce, my baby numbers, then the stretch factor changes down to 1.077. If I reduce and they, they really are having very few babies, then that largest eigenvalue could fall below one and we get reduction in this. But so there's two things to note that you can have oscillations at the beginning, but eventually the whole thing settles down. And then the eigenvalue tell you is whether the system is growing or shrinking. Any, do you want me to play with this a little bit more before you move on? What would you like me to change? When both of those, the, the first elements are the eigenvalues, when they're both below one, then we're shrink, they, these, along these two special directions, we're shrinking, we're shrinking around one and along two. And what I am about to show you is no matter where you start, it turns out that you can fully describe the dynamics by those shrinking factors. So it's not just true when you start on them, but elsewhere. If both of them, both of those eigenvalues are less than one, you'll shrink in all directions, no matter where you start. Yeah. And it's, it appears like that here, that if I increase M1 just a little bit to get it to be above one, You'd have to zero in, but it looks like it's growing. And then when I go below one, it looks like it's shrinking. But that's not very satisfying. You're not going to want to do a numerical analysis. So let's, let's move away from that kind of special examples and special numbers and say something more general. And I'm going to do this now, not just for a Leslie matrix, but any matrix, A, B, C, D. It's a two by two, but this, what I'm going to talk about, holds for no matter how large that matrix is. But we'll just do two by two. So here's a matrix, and it, and it can represent births and survival of adults and juveniles if you want, but it's just arbitrary. It could, it could reflect um, growth and movement between two types of environment, good and bad environment. It could reflect, I've used a model like this where it reflects methylation and unmethylated sites in the genome. Anyway, whatever you want. So I'm going to ask Mathematica to calculate the eigenvectors, and I'm going to show you that that same matrix, which is describing where the system is going over time, can be rewritten as another set of matrix operations called ADA inverse, where A contains the eigenvectors, D is a diagonal matrix with just the eigenvalues in it, and A inverse is the inverse of the A matrix. So for right now, you don't pay, we'll talk more about what those mean, but for right now, I just want to sh show you that you get back the same matrix. You do this set of junk and you get back the same matrix. All right, so I've asked Mathematica to find the eigenvectors and I've asked it to put them in the columns of a matrix that I'm calling A. That's my A matrix. I'm asking Mathematica to find, these are the eigenvalues. I can just have it, I can just write it this way instead. And I'm going to put the eigenvalues along the diagonal elements of this matrix. And you may already be thinking, oh, maybe this is a hint of why she's bothering to do this. The diagonal matrix are nice, and they're nice to power up, if you remember. I'm also going to ask Mathematica to find me the inverse of A. What's the inverse of A? When you have, do you know, like, if I multiplied 5 
times 0.2, they cancel each other out, right? Five times 0.2 and I get one. The, the inverse is the exact same thing for matrices. A matrix in general will stretch and rotate things. Its inverse will unstretch and unrotate, and you'll get back to the same number. And because of that, if we have a matrix A and we multiply it by its inverse, these are all dot product things, then we're going to get what's called an identity matrix out. And that identity matrix has ones along the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. And in particular, for our two by two case, it would just be one, zero, zero, one. And anytime you multiply anything by identity matrix, you just get that thing back. So while we're practicing our matrix multiplication, why don't we just do one example? We have some matrix, arbitrary matrix. We multiply it, it doesn't matter on the left or the right, by the identity matrix. What do we get out? Doing the same finger trick. A goes in the first row, first column. First row, second column is one times B plus zero. Moving to the second row, first column, A times zero plus C. And finally this one, B times zero plus D. You might go, why is she using her fingers? But honestly, when you're first learning matrix algebra, <laughs> You better use your fingers because it's really easy to lose track of where you are in it. Um, so anyway, identity matrices are playing that special um, operation, the same thing as the role that one plays in regular multiplication. When you multiply one by one, you get the same thing back. When you multiply a matrix A by its inverse, you get the same thing. You get one back and one times anything. The identity matrix times anything is just that matrix again. Same with a vector. Vector times identity matrix just gives it back. Um, and this is just asking mathemat. Even though these look complicated, if I ask Mathematica to multiply the inverse times A, I get the identity matrix, or the reverse A times, it's just math good. Mathematica has done what I asked it to. That's not what I want, though. I want this matrix. This is a matrix that I've claimed is identical to my original matrix. So let's go ahead and ask Mathematica. Remember, I defined a mat up above. It was pretty complicated. It was the eigenvector, the, these eigenvectors for this matrix. I defined D as this matrix, pretty complicated. I defined, I had it find the inverse matrix, pretty complicated. But I multiply all three of those together, pa, back I get A, B, C, D. Nice party trick. But we don't want just party. Why do I care about this math party trick? Well, um, first of all, this math party trick, like, why does it even work? To some extent, we are artificially forcing counting on our x and y axes. There's other ways we could count. And in particular, if we counted on the eigenvectors, then actually everything simplifies. We get growth by a factor lambda one on this axis. We get growth by a factor lambda two on this axis. And the dynamics are a lot simpler, just growing by that diagonal matrix every time point. So what this um, matrix operation does, is says, let's find the dynamics in this new system where everything's simple and then come back to our original coordinate system. And when we do that, that tells us that the system will grow um, by, the, by these diagonal elements along those eigenvectors. And um, how does this help us? Let's stay here for a second. So powering up the original matrix, any matrix is a chore, but powering up, I'm gonna do it by on the board because it's actually a cute calculation. Powering up A, D, a inverse is not a chore. We'll get to selection and evolution soon, but you need some algebra, you need some matrix stuff first. So I'm saying I can predict for any age structured population into the future if I could power up this matrix, this Leslie matrix, to the t's power. But that Leslie matrix 
um, raised to the teeth power is equal to a d a inverse raised to the teeth power. That doesn't look so good. But now just write this out as a product. A D A inverse, A D A inverse. These are all matrices. So on and so forth. Dot 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 until I get A D A inverse for the teeth time. Do you see something that's gonna cancel here? What's that? A inverses. These are just the identity matrix. I could write it in as I, but I know I times D is just D, so I'm not going to bother. A, D times D times D, T times times A inverse. In other words, just A, D to the T, A inverse. And now I'm really happy because just as we did with a two by two example where we had R1 and zero and zero and R2, any diagonal matrix is easy to power up. I can do it instantly in my, in my sleep. But this, if I write these eigenvalues on the diagonal, all I need to do is power them up and that'll give me that matrix to the teeth power. So we've solved it. And this helps us see that for this matrix, Whatever stretching it's doing, for that matrix to be growing the system, one of the eigenvalues has to be greater than one. If both are less than one, it'll be shrinking it. So that's, the, that's where we're, matrix algebra has really helped us. Now we have a way to think about growth of any structured population by finding these eigenvalues and figuring out whether or not it's, the system is growing or shrinking over time. And this is just getting Mathematica to do that powering up and to confirm with you that no matter how many times I take this matrix and I multiply D by itself, I just get the diagonal elements raised to the power. Whatever, I can do that for time T. Okay. So in um, recapping, what's A? A is a, um, a, a special matrix that has the eigenvectors, these directions in each column, I have to order them in the same way. So an eigenvalue, the, the first eigenvalue has to go with a special direction that it's the growth factor for. And I have to write them in the same order. But I can do that in the columns of A. I'm just gonna call all those eigenvectors U. So these are the special directions. This is one special direction, this is the other, just arbitrarily. The inverse of this matrix, I can call it something else. I can call it, I'm just going to call it V. Um, and I have to choose these Vs so that when I multiply it by A, the, the whole thing gives me the identity matrix. So A, I can choose in any arbitrary way, but then once its size is determined, the size of the inverse is determined. Oh, man. We've got this diagonal matrix. So... The, claim, the point is, no matter what those eigenvectors and eigenvalues are, we can um, solve the system into the future, either using the original matrix, which will be hard, or using this new trick, which will be easier. But let's think about what will happen over time. If one of these is larger and one of these is smaller, whatever their magnitudes are, over time, what will this diagonal matrix approach? This is the full diagonal matrix, but over time, let's simplify it. What will it look like? Be close to, maybe, maybe I should write this a different way. Let's say that the biggest one is the first one. Let's order them and the first one is the biggest one. So I can write this matrix as lambda one to the T, times um, one, zero, zero, lambda two to the T over lambda one to the T. This is just factoring out from that matrix, the biggest of the eigenvalues raised to the power T. Now, as I let time pass, the second one is smaller than this one. So what will happen as time, it will approach zero. This will go to zero as time passes. 
And we saw that graphically. There was a lot of oscillations and movements at first, but eventually it settled down. And it settled down to the special direction associated with a leading eigenvalue, that main stretching. So now what I want to say is we can, um, a lot of demographic theory makes this approximation that we've let it settle down. And we want to know when, how many juveniles will there be, do we expect in this population over the long run relative to adults? How many senior citizens do we expect in the long run in the population? And they make this approximation that the initial transients have disappeared and these other eigenvalues aren't that important anymore. And we're going to approximate the eigen, this diagonal matrix with just the first element and everything else here. We're, we're, we've almost got all the elements we need. Okay. So in general, we would have a, um, a prediction into the future over time that depended on both eigenvalues, but I'm saying the one that's growing fastest is the only one that we are gonna focus on, just this one. And if we approximate the D matrix, oh, I need to clear everything. Um, just click the kernel. Whoop. I don't want the specific matrix, I want the general one. Mm -hmm. Let's enter these things. Do -do -do. Enter that. So this is with all of the eigenvalues. Now I'm just going to drop the um, smaller eigenvalues, and I'm going to power up this new matrix to the power T. So this is only a component. This is a general solution in all future points in time. It depends on lambda 1 and lambda 2. Now I've only got a general solution into the future. This is projecting how many juveniles and adults will have sometime T in the future. But look at this. That's the, the only thing that depends on T is this eigenvalue, the biggest eigenvalue. And that's going to tell us the stretching factor. It's the only thing growing over time. So every generation, it's multiplied by lambda. The, the, the ratio of um, juveniles to adults, there's only one difference between this two, and that's this one. That's what I call the eigenvector. Eigenvector associated with that leading eigenvalue. The, it's technically called the right eigenvector. That right eigenvector is telling us how that ratio, how many juveniles there will be to adults. Normally in, a, in demographic models, those are, the, the direction is arbitrary in length, but we describe them as proportions, the proportion of juveniles and the proportion of adults at the stable age distribution. So these are just chosen to sum to one. And so the, this first vector, this, um, the eigenvector is telling us how, how many juveniles and adults to expect. The eigenvalue associated with it is telling us how the population grows over time. And then there's one other factor I haven't talked about yet. It's this thing here. The Vs, remember, this, these Vs are the first row of that inverse matrix. But I haven't told you what that means or anything. But notice what they're doing. The first element in the first row is being multiplied by the number of individual juveniles we start with. And the second is multiplied by the number of adults we start with. And these, this other eigenvector, this Vs, represent what's called reproductive values. How important is an individual of an age class to the growth of the future population? That's what a reproductive value is. And so your initial population is you adjust it. If you have... If, if juveniles are really, really important to the birth, to the future population size, then you want to up, and you have a lot of juveniles, then you want to adjust your initial population size up. Just as an example, if I started with a, a human population model and I only had women over age 60, then what's, even if I had a lot of them, what's my initial adjusted population size? Zero. Re as, as sadly, we hit a, a reproductive menopause. After that age, the women after that age have zero future, zero reproductive value, myself included. <sighs> and that doesn't mean we haven't reproduced in the past. It means from this point on, our presence or absence doesn't inf influence the growth of the population. And so this um, 
adjustment takes your initial population size and adjusts by just how many, how much growth do you expect from each age class? And that is called, technically it's a left eigenvector, um, but in, in demography, those are called reproductive values. All right. So just to recap, you don't want to power up any matrix. You don't want to do that. But you can rewrite it in a form where actually the time is only encapsulated on this diagonal element of a D matrix. That, that you can power up. If you only focus on the biggest of those eigenvalues in that D matrix, then you're going to get a sense of where the long-term trajectory of the population is going to settle upon. The vector it settles upon is given by the stable age distribution, those lines that I drew in the plot above. And we adjust for the initial population size by accounting for how valuable individuals are to the growth of the future population. Hopefully I'm valuable for other things, but I'm not valuable for that. Okay, so any questions? This is like some basic, like trying to shove a whole bunch of matrix algebra in one little bit. Yeah. And maybe if I have time, I'll show you some of the projections from Canada so we can compare the actual changes in the population size to what was actually seen. Um, there's kind of, yeah, it's not, it's not too bad. It's not too bad over a short time scale. Um, for the Canadian population, well, just a, a brief comment, the main thing not in this model is migration. And so you actually see the age distribution that this predicts from this eigenvector associated with leading eigenvalue is wrong because there's more younger individuals immigrating in. And why just younger individuals? Well, Canada sets a uh, policy so that it's preferentially favoring um, visas or for younger individuals. So you can see that in the, um, uh, the age distribution is just slightly shifted up fewer kids migrating, fewer older individuals migrating. So you can see this little pook um, that perturbs this. But I, we also have the vector of migrants, so you can incorporate that into this model. Yeah. And then you might say, but how about the, the big elephant in the room is how about density dependence, which I'm not even including. And that's why I was kind of saying, whenever we do these matrices, we're empirically, we're measuring them now. For the, we're getting the birth rates and survival rates now, whatever that density dependence is going on. So it's a snapshot of how the population is growing now. And, and so as long as we don't take this too far into the future and we don't have changing competition or what have you, it gives us a snapshot of growth. Okay. But yeah, that's before we go too far uh, down this um, tunnel, we have to know, is this even useful? All right, so this is what we've, we were just talking about. We can write this in another form and get this approximation um, where I've ordered the eigenvalues so that the lambda is the largest one. And this n adjust is just the adjustment to the initial population size. All right. So that's just the same equation. And just to give us a little bit of um, demographic notation again, this is, I've mentioned these terms, but just so we have them again. That, no, that's not what I want. Okay. The stable age distribution is given by the eigenvector. The and it describes the fraction of the population in each age class. It sums to one by convention. And if I were using this on my COVID model, it would be the fraction in the um, exposed, presymptomatic, asymptomatic, and infected stages, right? So this doesn't, this is true whether it's a Leslie matrix or not. The dominant eigenvalue measures the asymptotic population growth rate, by which I mean the population growth rate once it settles down to that direction. And if I take this equation and I sum those all of, over all of the ages, I equals one to the number of age classes, 
then I, and I, and u is chosen to sum to one, then I get the total population size will grow according to lambda c. So it's telling us whether the total population is going to grow or shrink over time. And so if lambda is one, we get exact replacement. Lambda greater than one, it grows. Lambda less than one, it shrinks. Just to recap. And then the other notation that I introduced was reproductive values. Those are technically the left eigenvectors. And the Vs describe the contribution of each age to the long-term growth of the population. And if you set Us to sum to proportions, you have to have V times U equal to one. Otherwise, you're not going to get a, a inverse being the identity matrix. So this, these aren't arbitrary, these ones. Okay. So for most matrices, you have to find the eigenvalues the technical way. And the way you find eigenvalues for any matrix is this operation that you take the determinant of the matrix minus the, ooh, that should have a lambda in it, minus, otherwise there's no lambda. Let me just add that in so we're not confused. That determinant then gives you a polynomial function of the lambdas with n land uh, with the, with n roots lambda and those are the eigenvalues the n eigenvalues they may be some repeated ones but those are the those are the eigenvalues it can be a chore especially for a large matrix but the euler laka proved another alternative way of writing finding the largest eigenvalue and it's given the largest eigenvalue is given by this equation here where li is the probability of surviving up until age i not including that age i. So it's the probability of survival in all of the age classes before this one. And it's just the sum of those. Why? Um, sorry about the notation. I haven't gotten around to fixing this slide, but uh, we can justify this or understand this. I'm gonna rewrite that eigenvalue lambda as e to the r. r is the growth rate, the exponential growth rate of the population, but that's just another way of writing the eigenvalue. So the, that's just a definition. So if we have a total number, the number of newborns at any point in time is equal to um, the number of newborns at every previous census that survived to today and gave birth. That's this. They, at some time in the past, that was the number of the newborns in age class zero, the, the newborn class, they had to survive to the present, and then they had to give birth in the present. And so what o the euler laka equation noticed is that if the whole population is growing exponentially, so the total population is some constant growing exponentially, and if we're at this stable age distribution, then each of those age classes must be growing exponentially over time. So those new, that if the newborn class now is growing exponentially, the newborn class in the past would have grown exponentially, but it doesn't have as much time, right? Because it was X time steps, X censuses ago. So there's not quite as many newborns in the past if the population is growing. Cancel out the Ks, divide both sides by E to the minus E to the RT, and we get the um, euler laka equation for the leading eigenvalue um, and this is just one, e to the minus r is just one over lambda. So we can write it as lambda or we can write it as e to the minus r. So it's, that's nice. And what this allows us to do is we don't have to calculate that ugly determinant of the matrix minus lambda i and find all of the eigenvalues when all we really want is the biggest one. And so in demography, this is typically how that biggest one is found. That's a lot on demography. And I haven't even gotten to selection because so far everything is one type. Yeah. yeah. That's right. In the graph, it was the largest in magnitude. Just as a question, let's say the largest one is 1 1.5, and the other one is minus 1.3. And I compare that to a, that's the, these are the eigenvalues, 1 and 2. And I compare that to a case where it's 1.5 and 0.3. Let's make it negative as well. Which of these, if those are the two sets of eigenvalues, and which system will it approach that stable age distribution faster? Top, top. 
top one, that's right. And that's because this raised to the power t will go away slower than this raised to the power t. So the stable age distribution should work better, faster here. And then we'll, and the stable age distribution will be really nice, except if these two are equal in magnitude or really, really close, and then it can take a long, long time. But in the demographic models I've played with, normally there's a big difference between the first and the second eigenvalue in magnitude. You might go, well, is it possible that I'd have negative eigenvalues for both? And what does it mean to have a negative population size? And there's this neat theorem from linear algebra that if all of the elements in the matrix are not negative, then your leading eigenvalue won't be negative, which is nice because we won't want population size to go positive, negative, positive, negative every time step. Anyway, you might have been worried about that, and it's not a worry for us, fortunately. But let's go to selection. So if a mutation alters the elements, the vital rates, it alters birth rates, it alters survival rates, something, one of those vital rates, I'm going to let the, that just stand be um, represented by z, z. So there's something that it's changing. Then the eigenvalues are going to change. And in general, we can calculate how much the eigenvalue changes by a change, a mutational change, by calculating what's called a sensitivity. How much does changing this vital rate change the growth or shrinkage of the population? You can do this for mutations. You can also do this by comparing policies. So if you want to feed your babies more, or if you want to feed older individuals more, which is going to improve the growth of the whole population in a conservation context? So the same calculations are done. Well, what's nice is that at this, um, uh, this asymptotic um, growth along that vector, we actually don't have to calculate all the eigenvectors. We can just take the matrix and take the derivative. The matrix is known. So we're just taking a derivative of the elements of that matrix with respect to whatever is changing by our conservation policies or the mutation. And Z star just represents the wild type. So we have an, a formula that's in terms of a very easy to calculate derivative. We're just taking our whatever, A, B, C, D. And if we wanna know what's the change in the eigenvalue, if I change, say, C, you know, I would just take the derivative of this with respect to C. In that case, it's only, it'll be 0, 0, 0, 1. And that's going to be this derivative matrix. It might change all of the survival probabilities by a constant. That's why I'm kind of being arbitrary here about how the mutation acts. But this, this simplifies it. And this tells us how that growth of the population will be changed by a mutation. Implicitly in that, we're going back to something like the haploid model, where we're really only paying attention to something that breeds true, a different type or a specific single allele that breeds true. We're not dealing with sex and recombination. Um, oftentimes, you see this in a slightly, well, oftentimes we want to measure for selection the relative effect on growth relative to the wild type. And the wild type's growth rate was lambda. So we can take that and say, how much does lambda change relative to the wild type? This is giving us more like a relative fitness. And if you plug in the alternative way of writing lambda is e to the r for lambda, then this, it turns out, is just dr dz. Either way, it doesn't much matter. If, um, but this dr dz is how it tends to be written in the literature. And it was Hall, Hamilton in 1966, and Charlesworth has an excellent book on selection and age-structured populations that if you're working with them, I would highly recommend reading. But he first showed that selection pressures acting on life history are best measured by the sensitivity of R to changes in vital rates. And that's because changes in R are really telling us what the proportional change in lambda is over time. So... In other words, if you have a mutation that increases birth rate at age A, that's this MA, we need to find that derivative. But for a uh, uh, Leslie matrix, for a demographic model, we have this nice euler lacke formula. If you look in that summation, where does MA enter? It only is present 
in when I is equal to A in the age A class. So most of the sum will go away, and the only thing we're left with is LA, MA, which goes away when we take the derivative of it, times E to the minus RA. That's where this comes from. And that's going to tell us the strength of selection acting on each age class, birth rate in each age class. How does selection act on, the, on survival? So typically, this is not done on the survival rate from one census to the next, but typically it's presented as the instantaneous um, survival probability um, or death rate, sorry. So that the survival probability is written as e to the minus mu a. So these are instantaneous death rates. And if you take the derivative of um, the log of the survival rates, then you get a, the equivalent of the derivative with respect to the death rates. Um, and if you look, where, okay, so where are these survival probabilities? Remember I said the L's were survival up until a given age? So survival up until age, if I change the survival at age A, I won't influence any of the L's for younger age classes because they don't survive to that age. I'll only influence the survival of probability from birth to age class beyond that age. And so you take that sum and you lop off all of the terms that are below that and you just start beyond the age class that you're at. And that's the only ones that will be influenced by a change in the survival probability. Um, and uh, you might go, what happened to the PA itself? But because we're taking the log of it, then that PA disappears from this equation. And we just have the lifetime survival 2Hi times Mi times E to the minus I, Ri. So now we're ready for some implications. Alleles that influence life history such that R is increased, they spread at a faster rate than other alleles and invade the population. Even for a diploid model, that would be true with, if we were talking about the heterozygous effects. Eventually, the heterozygotes make homozygotes, and we have to deal with that. But at least this would tell us the initial spread. Changes in the viral rates only matter in so much as they cha those changes are reflected in the long-term growth rate. Otherwise, it's not going to change. So if the survival and the birth rates are, are changed, but they're changed in such a way that the lambdas don't change, then they, they won't have any evolution. They'll be neutral, even if they are changing the viral rates. How does selection act upon survival? So this is from the previous page. How does that act upon survival after menopause? After menopause, what are the MIs? Zero. So there is no selection on survival after menopause. Not directly, not um, acting directly on those age classes. And the other thing that is important to recognize is that if you hold the growth of the population constant, these sensitivities, how much selection there is on birth and how much selection there is on survival, they decrease with age because these Ls are a function of survival up until that age. At younger ages, it's easier to survive to one than it is to survive to 100. And the ones that survived to one are almost all ones. The ones that survive to 100 are almost nobody. So these LAs, which is survival from birth to that age, go down with age classes. So the sensitivities always decrease with increasing age because alleles that act late in life have a lower chance of ever being expressed due to the fact that it's hard to make it to old age. So the implications of this, that, that what I just stated was that alleles acting late in life affect R less strongly and thus experience weaker selection than alleles acting early in life. And it has three important evolutionary consequences. The first one, alleles that increase early survival or fertility at the cost of later survival or fertility will tend to be favored. And that's because the earlier ones witness strong selection. The ones that act on late in life, certainly after menopause, but even towards the end of life, they tend to be experience weaker selection. So it's harder for evolution to optimize late life traits simply because there's hardly anybody in the population that is in that late flight trait. 
And so if there are mutations that help you a lot when you're a kid and, and hurt you a little when you're an adult, they'll tend to accumulate. And that is called the antagonistic pleiotropy um, explanation for aging. The, we, the, there's an accumulation of mutations. The ones that are really favored are the ones that help you most when you're young, even if they hurt you less. Two variants of this is even if there's non-antagonistic pleiotropy and mutations are just deleterious, if they're deleterious and they act when you're young, they're going to experience really strong selection. If they're deleterious and they act when you're old, very weak selection. Just because so it's hard to get to that age. Vice versa for beneficial mutations. Beneficial mutations that affect early life traits, vital rates, are going to witness the strongest selection. So it'll be, you'll see rapid adaptation, faster adaptation, um, for early life traits. And this, so consequently, for all three of these reasons, whether there's antagonistic pleiotropy, only deleterious, only beneficial, but there's certainly going to be all three, it is expected that the survival or, or fertility rate will decrease with age, at least once sexual maturity is reached. And this is the evolutionary explanation for senescence. For senescence being... Defined as the tendency for the age-specific survival probabilities and fecundities to decline with age for individuals of sufficiently advanced age. This process of decline at the level of life history traits reflects the decline in performance of many different physiological functions with respect to age and the increase in incidence of pathological factors such as cancer and cardiovascular disease skin tone, muscles, back aches, you name it, all of those things are under less selection if they affect you late in age. So senescence, just to, uh, for those of you who are, um, want a slightly more technical definition, if the survival rate, if this is age, and I'm plotting this survival rate at age, then if that were constant over time, that would be no senescence. And these arguments that um, there's weaker and weaker selection on, on vital rates later in life suggests that instead we should get um, uh, survival rates that decline with age. All else being equal. Yeah. How do mutations decide? Alleles, genes. Oh, well, they don't decide anything, but um, I think maybe flipping it around, what are the chances that an, a, a mutation will affect you equally at all life stages? I mean, if it does, then this argument doesn't hold. But for example, if it affects your development rate, if it affects your head size in the birth canal, that can affect um, survival rates early in life, but that doesn't matter much later in life, your head size much. Those, those are examples. If it affects heart attack risk, but that's, but heart attacks, your heart is robust when you're a kid and it just takes a while before um, you, you build up the cholesterol or whatever to be at risk of a heart attack. That would be an example. So the mutations, mutations often don't have an equal effect on everybody. They can have an effect that's different in males and females, and they can have an effect that's different on um, every stage of the life. And so this is just saying, if they do, then what? Vital rates drop, given that the vital rates drop, uh, what causes the drop? Oh, so the, sorry, so survival and birth are the vital rates. And this is saying that we expect the survival the rate, and rate. birth rates to drop with age. But one assumes that a full theory would set a scale. So why is there a scale? So with respect to a menopausal age, I understand yeah. this, but something else sets that. Yeah, even, even for the, so the reproductive value is really set it. Um, um, and you can see that in this other form. So I said that um, this is a general form of how selection acts on a matrix of all ages. But notice that it depends on those reproductive values. And so if you, for menopausal ages, those are zero. But this also helps us generalize it to say, what about the age right before menopause or before that? Um, so, so 
yeah, that's what that's what sets the relative amount of selection witnessed at each age is just how important that so age is. I, I can understand this is a derivative yep. from that fixed point, uh, given that you start off with some po wild type population. Wild type population, but yeah. if, if you keep following this argument, then it seems like you should get a total collapse because you keep uh, increasing all kinds of. Uh, Ah, oh, right, right, right. So maybe, maybe what you're saying, and I think this is true, is let's say that we go back to the very beginning of time, and we had this vital rate. Mutations that increased survival at early ages, those would have been really strongly favored. Ones that were, maybe there's one that, a mutation that really increased um, late life, but it, it disappeared, its probability fixation was zero. It was lost because it wasn't experiencing much selection. So over time, this has shifted up, and this one, is accumulating deleterious mutations, so it shifts in this direction. On, on average, you expect the whole population to be growing faster and faster because this process is increasing that lambda over time. You're not getting, these mutations aren't decreasing lambda, unless the, the rare deleterious mutation fixes. Oh, okay, good. What was that? Um, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. That's right. That's right. They, with, except for one thing, and that is if you have births at all ages, so you don't have a menopause, then all age classes contribute to that leading eigenvalue and that direction, that leading eigenvector. So, so uh, it's only the age classes that have no um, future reproduction that disappear along that um, eigenvector. So it's just a way we've taken our original matrix M that had all of our vital rates in it, whatever they were. And we've just kind of reoriented to different axes, but all of the axes are still there. No, no, and that's, that's, that's what this sensitive, sensitivity tells you. No, they don't all equal. And the ones that are, act earlier in life have a bigger effect on that eigenvalue and that growth rate, just simply because it's easier to make it to that age. And everything else gets discounted by having to survive then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, under the antagonistic pleiotropy, if we increase those alleles, like ones that survive, that allow mothers to survive through childbirth, even though they they were would have died originally, we're allowing alleles to rise in frequency at late age. That you're right, have negative consequences for early age. But that requires that there is a lot of antagonistic pleiotropy. I'm not sure how often that's true versus developmental chance or what have you. So we don't know how strong that counter selection is and ethically what are we going to do yeah. i'm glad i'm alive yeah yep yep yeah and that goes back to that mutation load if you relax selection you accumulate mutation load again what an ethical question what are we going to do and I think the answer is medicine is, that is true, that our, look at our eyes or what, there's a lot higher rate of survival through um, diseases that would have killed us in the past. But medicine is Im improving and sometimes we're, we're, we're actually getting better at solving the problem at the, at the core too. So, um, you know, I think while that's true, and we, first of all, do we really care what's going to happen to us a million years in the future? <laughs> and second, ethically, I think we have to act with what we can do to save lives today. 
But it is true that saving lives is allowing mutations that would have otherwise been eliminated to accumulate. And so in the long term, what you're going to want to do is balance that by actually maybe detecting those mutations or um, potentially even reversing those mutations. But then you get into all sorts of ethical questions about genetic engineering. I think people are comfortable with that with respect to changing, like cystic fibrosis, a lot of the new technologies don't ch are, are not about changing that gene in the baby, but are about changing that gene or its products in the lungs. And so it gets easier and easier to treat. But yeah, it, it, I, I'm not, I don't know anything about the answers to that ethical dilemma. It's a big one. Well, a big one for the future, not, not for today. Um, just, just, I think you guys have kind of touched on this, but let's, I want to talk just briefly, just quickly. Let's imagine that we have a tree that has, I've been talking about humans and, and the fact that we have low reproductive value at late age. That's not true for every species. Some species have no reproduction, no reproduction until they're the largest tree in the forest. And then they produce everything. And so then it's not the case. Then you basically, this equation gets weighted by no births, no births, no births, and then a huge amount of births. And so in species like that, you can flip the relationship and actually not get senescence. If the, if the birth rate goes up with age, then selection acts strongly on those late age classes. Here's another, I'm just, there's a really controversial topic in the field right now about what if we make the environment harsher or easier? And by the arguments that I said before, that would make it seem like, well, if you, make, you live in a harsher environment, all your survival rates are going down. And so that should make early life histories matter more. But it turns out, if you live in a harsher environment, all the L's go down, but all the R's go down too. You're going to grow at a lower rate. And it exactly balances out in an exponentially growing population. So it's not such an easy prediction. This is um, a prediction made by Williams. It's quite controversial. There's a recent series of debates about this in tree trends in genetics, trends in ecology and evolution by Murad et al. and Dan Ambrose. But the bottom line is in this easy case that I'm considering here, it cancels out. I'm not gonna show you that much here, just to point out that if we go back to the first lecture I gave, I had this complicated set of equations and actually they aren't linear because I have things like you had to be susceptible and then you had to contact somebody that was infected. But if the population size is really large, if I have 5 million people in British Columbia and a few of them get infected, I still have 5 million people in British Columbia that are susceptible. And so over the time scales of an early epidemic, that number stays constant. So treating us is constant, like it's not changing fast over this, this epidemic wave at first then I have a linear set of equations that I can write in matrix form and do the very same sort of acrobatics that I've just done. I can add mutations and I can track the spread of those mutant lineages by doing the same thing that I was talking about before, taking the derivative taking selection, defining selection as how does a, a new lineage that affects all of these transition rates how does it spread over time? Same, same techniques. And that is the black box that I was talking about uncovered. That is how I figured, how we figured out how selection acts on, on each of these transition rates. And what I didn't say last time is that this answer depends on the mutant effects, these delta terms, but there's also these U terms. These U terms are this, are represent what fraction of the population will be asymptotically in each of these disease states. And it also has these V terms, which is how important is a particular, is the growth of, the, of COVID to being in this state, this state, this state, or that state. And we know a lot about those. We know that the, in a growing population, the younger, individ, the younger you are, the more reproductive value you are in the case of a disease, because you will have exposed individuals will have um, transmissions here and here and here whereas these ones are almost at the end. So anyway, that even though this is not a linear model, um, oftentimes there are regimes in which the linear models do give you some insight into what might be happening. So that's it. Thank you.